Psalm 37, if you would please stand as we read the Word of God, Psalm 37, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself, because... Of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. In this psalm, we have uh, several uh, commands or several uh, direction, directives, I guess we could say, in, in this psalm and in these verses that we just read. And so I'm going to title this message, Counsel for Christians. This psalm gives us some good advice. And the advice giving, given to us here are stepping stones into the blessed life of faith and fullness. And so we'll cover part of these today and then we'll pick up next week with the rest of them. But God gives us, you know, Psalm 37 is actually a very great psalm, very good psalm. I, my intention was to just preach on these first nine verses as I got to read them and uh, things, but I, I may, I'm not sure yet, don't hold me to it. I, I may actually uh, take some time and go through this psalm. This is a great psalm, and I believe we can learn a lot from it. But today we're going to learn some counsel for Christians. Counsels for Christians. First of all, he tells us, the Bible tells us to fret not. Look in verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. In other words, we're not to get all bent out of shape over what the world is doing. This word, this word fret, it means to rub or to gnaw, to wear away or to agitate. You know, sometimes we do get agitated at the way the world does, at the things that the world does. And we wonder sometimes why the, uh, the wicked prosper so much in, in, the, in the wickedness that they do. And we get gnawed at it. Man, it just rubs us raw. It bothers us. And you know, I, I believe it even bothered David. No doubt he felt this. You know, we can read in the Bible where uh, King David, well, before he was king, he had to run from Saul. And all David wanted to do was help Saul. In fact, I believe that David was probably Saul's most loyal uh, uh, servant. And, and uh, you know, it could probably uh, be argued that maybe Jonathan was, but David and Jonathan, they both were loyal to King Saul. And, then, you know, Saul tried to kill him. Yes. And Saul was out for his life. And when, when God turned, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when God turned Saul over and said, I'm done with you, and he raised up uh, David, Saul was after him. And, and, and you know, uh, David, he probably thought God, all I'm doing is trying to live for you, and now I'm sitting here trying to trying to uh, uh, survive. But you know, not only that, as, as David was king, his son Absalom tried to overthrow him and to take his kingdom away. And, and no doubt David probably got agitated and, and angry at the at, at how somebody could just overthrow him when he's trying to do right. In fact, King David was the best king that Israel ever had. And so he might have been tempted to get agitated. He might have even thought, well, why are they prospering in their wickedness? Can you imagine what David must have felt in those times? He was trying to honor God, but others were against him. Now he has to run to stay alive. And so David, while he's thinking about their actions... 
I believe he begins to bring his thoughts into check. And he says, I'm not going to fret over what they're doing. These are workers of iniquity. I'm not going to let their thoughts and actions uh, affect my thoughts and actions toward God. And then he says in verse 1, he continues on, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. He's like, hey, listen, we don't, <coughs> we don't have to wish we were them. We don't have to wish we were in their shoes. Listen, I know that there's men that we can look to and think, wow, wouldn't it be great to be them? Bill Gates and maybe Jeff Bezos and, and, and the list goes on and on. And, but the thing is, is, you know what? We have peace in our hearts. Amen. These men don't. Amen. And we don't have to be envious in the workers of iniquity. This word envious means uneasiness, discontentment at the sight of superior excellence. You see, what happens is, well, it, where does envy start? It starts with the eyes. When we see something that somebody else has, we begin to get envious of that. We want that. That's why I believe God said, thou shalt not covet. Because we that we we get envious, we want that. And you know what that does? That makes us discontent with the blessings that God has given us. Amen. Listen, I'm human. I'm made out of the same stuff you're, you're made out of. And the thing is, is there's been times in my life where I've been in the ministry and, and, and I see a preacher or a missionary. They get blessed in a certain way, and I think, God, I'm serving you too. I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm living in your service too. God, why don't you bless me? <coughs> Excuse me. Why don't you bless me like you bless them? You see, what happens is when we look at other people and we're envious, we forget of the blessings that God has given us. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, I, you know, it, I've been reminded by these verses and God has blessed me just as much as He's blessed that other person. Amen. And you know what? God's not obligated to bless us all the same way. Right. Right. And I thank God for that. Because there's sometimes that God ministers to my need in a certain way that He doesn't do that for somebody else. But He does that for me. Amen. And listen, if we're not careful, we'll start getting agitated and, and rubbed the wrong way because we're fretting over Something. And this song tells us we're God's children and we're not to fret over what we see in other places and things going on with other people. I read this quote. I want you to listen to it. I think it's good. Fretfulness and envy are sins that are their own punishments. They are the uneasiness of spirit and the rottenness of the bones. It is therefore in kindness to ourselves that we are warned against them. When we fret and when, when, when we envy, we're punishing our own selves for that sin. Because if, unless, you get, uh, unless you get content with God and what He's blessed you with, you'll live in misery the rest of your life until you get that out of your life. Amen. Proverbs 24, 19. It says, fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. Now, Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. David wrote this, uh, this psalm here. And so we see a father writing this, fret not. And then we see Solomon, his son, write the same thing. So you know what I think? I think when the Bible tells us something, we ought to pay attention to it. But when it tells us something more than once, I think we really ought to pay attention to it. Because I think we have a problem with fretting and envying. If you would, please turn over to Psalm 73. I want you to look at this. Here we see another psalmist, Asaph. He warns against the same evil. 
Now, I need you to bear with me. I'm actually going to read this entire song. Because Asaph talks about some things here that I think we need to look at. Now, he starts off and he says, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such a, of a clean heart. Listen, if you've got a clean heart, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, he said God's good to you. All right? He's starting off with that verse. I believe he learned a lesson, and then he wrote this song down so that he it could remind him. But he's starting off on a good note. All right? But listen. But as for me, this is something that he learned before he wrote this song. Look at it. He said, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish. Didn't he, that, that's exactly opposite of what we just talked about, these commands. When I saw, what? The prosperity of the wicked. This is a man who lived exactly what we're preaching against. All right? Let's keep on going. Verse 4. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like the men, like other men. That means they, they, they didn't have troubles like other men. It seems like, oh, they're just invincible almost. Look at verse 6. Therefore pride compasseth them as about a chain. Uh, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? So he said, hey, these people, they're shaking their fists at God. They're blaspheming God. They're going through this earth, and they're just living their own thing. And it seems like nothing is happening to them. Look in verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. That means Asaph, he was looking, he was, man, he, it was, it was really bothering him. <coughs> Excuse me. It was really bothering him. Why in the world were people prospering and they were blaspheming God? And he tried to figure it out. He tried to make sense of it. He says it was too painful for him. But look at verse 17. Till I went to the sanctuary of God. Then understood I therein. He said, hey, I went to church and I heard preaching and then I realized that, that their end is hell. But my end is heaven. Amen. Amen. And that's it, man. Listen, that's it. We've got more in our hearts than they have in all their coffers. In everything that they own. Listen, we've got the King of Kings Amen. living inside of us. Amen. we got the man living inside of us. Verse 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. He's talking about when they, when they die. Listen. It all changes for them. As a dream. Verse 20. When one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Then he says, thus my heart was green, and I was pricked in my reins. You know what? He was convicted over the fact that he put these things that the wicked prosper, he put that above God. Look at verse 22. So foolish was I, ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? 
There is none of the earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish, but thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy words. Hey, he said, he, he said, I believe he learned this lesson. He was convicted. He said, there's nobody else that I want in this world besides God. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. He said, hey, listen, there's nothing that they can do for me. They're gone. Their end is hell, but my end is heaven. Amen. Amen. He said, for all they, uh, they that are far from thee shall perish. And I like this verse, but it's good for me. Draw near to God. Amen. You know what? If you're fretting or if you're envious over the wicked, you know what you need to do? You need to draw near to God. You need to draw up to Him, put your trust in Him, and realize He has blessed you. You know, the Bible gives us uh, some good advice for the same thing in, in, in the New Testament. In Hebrews 13.5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For uh, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hey, listen. <laughs> the promise, brother, I know. The promise that God will never leave me nor forsake me is greater than anything else that money can buy. Amen. I'd rather have that than anything else. And that's what that psalmist said. There is none of. Uh, uh, what, what was it? How did he say it? Whom have I in heaven but thee? There's none in the earth that I desire besides thee. Hey, Amen. Thank God for that. <laughs> He'll never leave us. That's, that's, worth, a, that's, that's worth more than all the money in the world combined. Is that we can have God living inside of us. And He'll never leave us. Amen. Listen. You think those men have that assurance? I seriously doubt it. I seriously doubt. I'm not saying that a rich man can't be saved. What I'm saying is, by their lifestyle, it don't look that way. And uh, so, God has given us peace in our hearts. So, first counsel we see today, fret not. Secondly, trust. Trust. Look in uh, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. You see, there's no virtue in being content without trusting. You know, if we're going to be content with the things that we have, we've got to trust God. This verse encourages not only to trust, but also to do good. You see, when we put our faith and trust in the Lord, faith is active. Yes. And so trusting uh, is active. It's not good enough to think that we're trusting God and then do as we please. We're trusting Him. We will do good. So if you're doing bad and sinning, then you're not trusting His Word. That it's better to live holy that He will punish sin. In verse 3, He continues on. He says, So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. See, God has promised us that if we trust in Him, He'll take care of our needs. And David even continues to mention this promise over in verse 3. 25, look in verse uh, Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. You see, David realized that God would take care of his need if he'll just trust in him. Amen. Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I like that. Hey, listen. Uh, you brothers in Christ, I love you, and I trust, and I trust you. But you know what? It's better to put a whole lot more trust in God than it is you. Amen. You know, listen. I'll do anything for you that I can. And, and our one preacher saying, he was just joking around. He said, "Listen." He said, "If you ever need anything, as long as it don't cost me my time or my money, I'll help you in any way I can." <laughs> you know. Now listen, I'll do anything for you that I can. But you know what? I'm just a man. I may let you down. I don't want to. I'll do the, I'll do the best and pastor as I can be. But you know what? I'll let you down sometimes. But you know what? God will never let you down. Amen. Amen. He will always take care of you. And so it's always more blessed to put trust in God 
than to put confidence in man. In fact, that's what a preacher's job is supposed to do anyway. When, when people come to the preacher and they say, Preacher, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? You know what I try to do? I try to take this Bible and give them a principle from this Bible so they can put confidence in God and not say, Well, the, we don't do this because the preacher said not to. That, that's not my cold, my friend. Listen, I'm trying to teach you to live holy, live right. And you say, Hey, we don't do this because God said not to. Amen. Because we're trying to put our faith and trust in Him. So, fret not, and then trust, and then last of all, we'll look at today is delight. Actually, yeah, delight. Uh, verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Now, we may question our trust if it doesn't lead to delight in the Lord. You see, these things build on one another. Don't fret because of what other people are doing. Trust in God. Yes. But when you completely trust Him in God, what does that do? That leads you to delight in Him. <clears throat> you see, if you have put your faith and trust in God, and He comes through for you, you know what? You can delight in Him with, with what He gives you. I remember, listen, I remember when I was in high school. Y'all forgive me for just a second. But I, I, I was in high school, and I used to flirt with all the girls, man. I flirt with all the girls all the time. And I wanted a girlfriend back. I wanted a girlfriend back. And I did. All the other guys, they had girlfriends. And I wanted a girlfriend back. You know what? I couldn't ever get a girlfriend. I, I just couldn't. I mean, they would flirt with me and all that stuff. But I just couldn't even get anybody to, you know, want to be my girlfriend. And that, that aggravated me. That did. That did. But you know what? As I grew as a Christian, I came to a place in my life where I said, God, in fact, I heard some preaching on the on, on this thing about dating and everything. And, and I finally just said, God, I'm just going to give this into your hands. I just want you to take it. And you just give me the wife you want me to have. Amen. And I went to my I went to my youth, uh, youth pastor and his wife. And I said, would y'all help me find a wife? And I just left it in their hands. You know, every once in a while I'd see a girl and, and, I, and I'd look at her and I'd say, no, she might be good. And I'd go to my youth pastor's wife. I said, what do you think about her? She'd say, no. Nope. You know what I did? I said, okay. You know what? I left it up to God. I left it up to somebody who was wise to help me with that thing. And she said, no. And I said, fine. Because I gave this thing over to God. And God put these people in my life to help me and give me guidance and direction. And I just trusted God. This is what I'm saying. I trusted God. Well, one time they, they asked me, they said, what do you want in a wife? I said, well, I said, I like tall women. And, uh, you know, I like redheaded girls. And, uh, and you know what? If I'm, if I'm going to be a pastor someday, I think it would be a good thing if she played the piano. Tall, redheaded, and played the piano. That was my, that was my three things, man. I'll tell you what, only God could have done that. I remember the night I saw her. I went to I went to my youth pastor's wife and, uh, and, and my pastor and my youth pastor and his wife. They were kind of talking, looking at me, and I just walked over and I said, "I said you can talk to her if you want to." They said, "Oh, we already have. <laughs> we already have." And 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 so, man, the rest is history. But here's what I'm saying: I trusted God for what He wanted to do for my life, and now I'm delighted. So all you've got to do is just trust God yes. and then delight. <laughs> yeah. Man, listen, it's a delight to let God just do something in your life instead of fretting over it. Amen. I've done learned that fretting over stuff doesn't work. Yes. If you just rest content God and trust in Him, then you'll be delighted with the outcome. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the uh, way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He said, this is a man that he, he says, I'm not going to uh, stay around sinners. He's going to stick to the things of God, and then he's going to be delighted in it. Listen. The only way we're going to be delighted in what God does for us is just uh, 
trust in Him Amen. and rest in His Word. But it says, uh, He shall give thee, he said, verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. This does Amen. not mean, folks, that, it, that we're going to try to delight in the Lord and He'll give us whatever we want. That's not what that means. It means that what God does is He puts the desire in our heart and then He gives us those desires. You see, when I submitted myself to the Lord, He gave me the desire to preach. There was a time when I said, God, whatever you want with my life, I'm just going to trust you with my life. And you know what? He gave me the desire to preach. And then I begged God to let me preach. And you know what? He called me to preach, amen. amen. Thank God for that. He gave me the desire of my heart. Amen. And then as I continued to grow as a preacher, I remember a preacher stood up one time and he talked about how there was a need for churches in the western United States. And he said, hey, listen. He said, out here in the southern U.S., you can go to church anywhere you want to. If you want red hymn books, you can find a church with red hymn books, blue hymn books, green hymn books, whatever. You can find a church whatever you want. If you don't like red carpet, go to a church that's got green carpet. I mean, you know what I'm saying. We had the choice of churches like that. And that broke my heart. He said, out west, they don't have that. And that broke my heart. God burdened me to come out west and to start a church. And you know what? Amen. God put a desire in my heart to start a church. Amen. Now here I'm, I'm standing here preaching to a church. Amen. Thank God for that. He gave me the desire in my heart. Amen. He put it in my heart and then He gave it to me. Amen. And so He says, if you commit yourself to the Lord, or excuse me, if you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll put the desire in your heart, and then He'll give you that desire. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Man, listen. That's, that's high living for a Christian to do these things. Don't be worried about the world gives you or what you see in the world. Don't be worried about all that stuff. Trust in God. Amen. And then just delight in what He does in your life. Yes. Amen. Thank God. I about wore out. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. God is good, amen. Yes, he is. And if you give Him your life, listen, let me just put it this way. God can do more with your life than you can. Yes. If you give Him your life, you'll be more delighted by it than what you can do in your own. Yes. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. As we close, I, I want to give you a few few more thoughts on what you listen. I don't know if you noticed or not, but this counsel that we gave today, it's a matter of the heart. Don't fret. Trust in God. Delight in the Lord. These are all dealing with attitudes of our heart. And God wants us to pay attention to the attitude of our heart. And I want to ask you this. We'll, we'll get to the rest of this next week, but I want to ask you, are you delighting in the Lord? If you're not really delighting, it's probably because you're not trusting in God for what He wants you to do in your life and the things that you need. You know what? If you're not trusting in God, it's probably because you're afraid about things that you see in this world. God's telling us that we're not afraid, but we're to trust and to delight ourselves in Him. Are you doing that today? Father,